Welcome to the uh, discussion on religion and the pandemic, sponsored by the International Associ Association of Religion Journalists. We are launching several such discussions for religion journalists uh, in different regions of the world. You might have been uh, watching the discussion from Asia or North America. Uh, they are there in the internet. And today we are uh, hosting a panel discussion from Europe. Uh, and later on, you will be able to see panel discussions also from Latin America and Africa. My name is uh, Astrid Dalehaug Nordheim. I live in Bergen, Norway, and you can see some of our mountains behind us here. Um, and I am a news editor of the uh, newspaper Dagen, and I'm also working for, at the Center for Investigative Journalism at the University of Bergen. And around Europe, we have uh, journalists uh, joining us. Um, Maria Paz uh, Lopez, she is with us from Berlin. She's the foreign correspondent uh, uh, and uh, a religion columnist of the Spanish uh, daily La Vanguardia. And from 2003 to 2009, she uh, was its uh, correspondent at, in the Vatican. And she was the uh, IRAJ's first chair and is currently in the board of directors. Tom Hennigan is joining us from Paris an American journalist based in Paris now and writes for the tablet in London and religion news service in Washington. He spent 40 years as a correspondent and editor for the Reuters, the last 14 of them as the religion editor coordinating the news agency's coverage of faith around the world. In addition, he also wrote about religion in Europe and Middle East. And he has been writing several books. And uh, from uh, uh, Montenegro, uh, so, yeah. working in Montenegro right now, but uh, living in Beograd, Serbia, Jelena Jorgacevic, journalist of the Serbian weekly news magazine Vreme, uh, covering mainly religion but also other social topics. She holds an MA in religion studies from the University of Erfurt in Germany. And she is doing her PhD at the University of Regensburg, also Germany, uh, on the topic of biographical memories of the church under communism. She is the re region representative for Europe in the IRAJ. Welcome and welcome to everyone watching us. So we are going to talk about the COVID situation, uh, working as a religion journalist. So how is first? the COVID situation now where you are. Let's start in Paris, Tom. How is it? In Paris, uh, I just took off my mask. It's <laughs> getting, it's, we had a very, very strict lockdown in the beginning, back in March to May. Then it opened up and now they're just going back to school and the government has been tightening up again. So, for example, we have to wear our masks everywhere outside before it was just inside if you went into a, sh a shop or things but now it's even out on the street so they uh they're getting more and more cases the hospital situation is okay so it you know it's not a worry anymore like it was in march but it's getting it's starting to get a little bit worse <laughs> and maria Paz, how is it in berlin so in Berlin, uh, now in Germany, we have an um, obligation of to wear masks in public transportation and inside all um, shops, but not all the open air. And schools have started in most lenders uh, with no obligation of masks inside the classroom. Uh, we have in, um, some more cases now. It's this uh, famous second wave, but it's a small second wave that we are going to see around Europe and around the world. And we have to, of course, prepare, prepare for that. Okay, thank you. And Yelena, how is it down in Montenegro and Beograd? Well, in, in, it's getting better. Actually, it's quite different. In Serbia, uh, we had a really harsh two months, June and July, because uh, we had some uh, tricky situation with the uh, we had election and it proved that uh, our government did not tell us the real number of people who are sick and the situation were very relaxed 
because people thought it's very relaxed. And the end, of course, later on, it was an explosion because we didn't know how it was going on. So we had terrible two months and now it's, it's getting better. And we will see now what is going to be in September with schools and kindergartens and so on. So that, mm -hmm. is, uh, that is the question. In Montenegro, uh, they, at the start, they did great. So uh, they had some, uh, and now it's so-so. But it's, for now, it is okay. And as I can see, at least here in the seaside, they're very responsible in, in shops, in markets, they wear masks, in, in the taxis, everywhere. So it looks mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds familiar. Here in Norway, we had a strict lockdown in March and uh, schools and everything closing down and um, during summer a little less restrict restrictions but now there is a second wave co coming not it's more local and local lockdowns but here in the bergen and students uh, city we have had a, a a small breakout now so yeah thank you and uh, we are all religion writers and we're going to discuss how uh, religious groups uh, has been affected or what have they been doing through the pandemic so what are you seeing where you live and what the, where, the area you cover uh tom can i ask you first uh yeah the area i cover is uh france and the benelux countries for the tablet so in france uh, especially that's obviously the biggest one uh one thing you have to remember in France, of course, is the very, very strong secularization. So 66% of the people will say they're Catholic, but only about 5% of them go to church. Mm -hmm. And so you have all these beautiful churches around, but that doesn't mean that, that they're very well frequented. When the lockdown came, of course, there was no attendance. So everybody went along with that. And the bishop said, yes, we, you know, we agree with this. It was when the reopening started, then you started to get some problems because the reopening was in May 11th, but they said churches wouldn't open up until June. Catholics immediately yeah. said, oh, we need Pentecost. We want to have a feast day. So they put pressure on the government for that. Uh, problem was there was the Muslim end of Ramadan and they had already said, we're not opening up the mosques for the end of Ramadan. And suddenly at the last minute, the, the Catholics were able to open up and the Muslims were caught short. And that caused problems, it, nothing really big, but it caused some, uh, some tension there. Now, it, most, uh, almost every church is reopened, but of course they have uh, social distancing, so they take much smaller numbers. Uh, in fact, in a lot of French churches, that's just fine because they didn't fill them up before anyway. Mm. But like the English language Catholic church here in Paris, which is mostly foreigners going there, they're packed all the time. So you go there and suddenly only 60 people are allowed in and you have to make reservations. That's very strange. Mm. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's the main overview. Yeah. So how is it in uh, Germany, uh, Maria Paz? So I have to say that both in Germany and Spain, I uh, would like to mention also too, generally speaking, like religions leaders and uh, communities of all faiths have abode very well to the, to the recommendations and the rules uh, of, the, of the governments. Um, in Germany, there were only uh, two isolated cases. Uh, there was two clusters of infections that could be traced to religious services. One was a Pentecostal service and the other was a Baptist uh, church in near Frankfurt, uh, where, where they had been singing. And singing, uh, as you know, is not allowed inside the building because, you know, the drops, droplets can get out of the mouth and provoke infection. But it was isolated cases. Uh, in Spain, there was um, a small controversy uh, related to a funeral that uh, took place in the Basilica of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, but it was most, mostly a political thing within the regional government because actually the cardinal and the faithful kept the distances, so there was no, no issue uh, with that. I'd like to mention um, an interesting joint document that uh, was published precisely last week 
uh, a joint initiative by the um, Pontifical Council of um, Interreligious Dialogue in Rome and the World Council of Churches, which is a fellowship of Protestant, Orthodox, and um, Anglican and Reformed churches. I don't know if you want me to ask you to go on this now, or I can go to, to that uh, later, whatever you prefer. Please. Go uh, on? Yes, please. Okay, so this document is uh, very interesting to me because it, it, the, the title is very significant. It's Serving a Wounded World uh, in Interreligious Solidarity, a Christian Call to Reflection and Action During COVID-19 and Beyond. And uh, this document encourages all churches and Christian organizations to engage in interreligious solidarity, uh, not only during the pandemic, but to address other wants of the planet, of the society. And this is interesting because most uh, communities were already doing it, but now you get like the, so to say, legal frame that you are encouraged to do that. And mm. this text also uh, is written in a way that tries to be useful also for practitioners of other faiths Mm. Uh, who have already responded to COVID-19 uh, with similar so thoughts in their own traditions. So um, I find it interesting that also uh, at the top leadership of the, um, uh, um, of the churches, of the communities, they, 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 they press for action. They, they feel that, that this is a, a historical moment in which interreligious and ecumenical effort can be enhanced uh, because mm. of uh, the pandemic. I'll, we'll come back to what they're really doing, but let's hear from Elena first. Uh, how has the religious uh, group responded to the COVID in your uh, area, Elena? Well, uh, there, there were, uh, as I, as I am hearing the other speakers, there were more tension in, in Serbia and also I think in Croatia. And as I noticed uh, in these countries with, with communist heritage as Poland, Russia, Serbia, uh, there is always that association, you know, and they're always trying to uh, say, okay, the uh, government again do, does, or society, or never mind, but someone uh, forbids us uh, to worship, forbid us to have uh, its services. And uh, at first it didn't rise, but, uh, but at least in Serbia, uh, soon you, ca you could heard from the church uh, leadership that narrative. You know, it's again the, the talking about that communism times, and uh, also uh, you you could often hear that word discrimination because from one point the church and the part not the whole but feel discriminated because they cannot freely worship and uh, restriction of gatherings. But from the other point, uh, usually you know um, governments say okay it's forbidden, but if something happens, no, no one is punished. So let's okay. just be blind on, on one eye a little bit. So the other said, okay, now we are discriminated who are not religious because we cannot get her, we will be punished, we will be prosecuted, so on and so on. Why church can something that we cannot? So, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, that was a question of money because the government at that moment during the COVID gave a huge amount of money for building the temple, of, of uh, the main temple in Belgrade. So now we have health system which is poor and now you're, so, so that was a really few points of huge tensions. Mm -hmm. But from mm -hmm. the other side, uh, what was for me, I think good and surprising that you could hear different voices within the church because you don't hear so often that theological, you know, discussions in, in our public sphere, to be honest. But now you could hear, and it was also the rift within the church, but mm -hmm. you could hear that pluralism of voices in the religious mm. community, in the churches. So what's the, what was the big debate about? What well, the big debate, debate actually was Eucharist. Uh, oh. Should it be, uh, should it happen uh, during COVID times or not? For mm -hmm. once, you know, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if, if you're a Christian, yes, of course, that you will go to the liturgy and so on and so on. For other, it was like, okay, we will wait because it's the, now it's virus, so we will wait until it is safe. And it was the main point of discussion, and it get, got very harsh at the end. And then you know, it was public. even from it was public discussion, and it was public uh, it was discussion conflict even within the church between bishops, not you mm. know between the bishops within the part of society. It, it, it became, and it was for the, the spokesman of the SOC announced uh, one uh, announcement which was which sounded like everyone who, who are real Christian, they will, 
you know, go to Devhurst, who are not, they were not. So it was that line. Mm -hmm. uh, and, okay, it's more complex, but this is some basics of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Maria Paz and uh, Tom, have there been uh, similar debates going on where you are? No, not, not really, because it was mostly about following the rules uh, and, uh, uh, and just uh, protect um, uh, public health. So, uh, I, no, no, not that I'm not aware of, really. Yeah. No, yeah. not really, not. Mm. The only, the only thing that we noticed uh, here, this question of discrimination, that only came from the evangelical churches. I noticed that Maria Paz also mentioned evangelical churches. It's not like in America where they're big and, and have some political influence. They're very marginal here. But the biggest breakout was in an evangelical church in Mulhouse in Eastern France. And uh, uh, when you think about it, Evangelicals here very often don't even have their own church. They just rent a hall. Very often they don't even have windows. Then they have long services where they sing a lot and they're, they're you know, quite active. And it's no wonder that that's a kind of vector for, uh, an, for infection like that. Some, then they, they, some of them started to say, well, we're discriminated against, but it was, and there were very, very few because it's a small number. But then the other the people in other churches, like Catholic churches, say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're not singing, we have bigger churches, why can't we do this? Towards, towards the end of the, uh, you know, when, when they were easing up the lockdown, then you started to hear that. But it wasn't that big. It, not like, it, it sounds like Yelena's situation was much more open, public, and... Uh, yeah. And here you... One, one uh, difficult... Sorry. Just one... Uh, um, sad and interesting development of this corona crisis here in Germany, which has nothing to do with authorities or with faith communities, is have you seen this um, demonstrations yeah. of uh, far-right activists yeah. and, uh, you know, conspiranoics and uh, this um, anti-vaccination activists. So there's a lot of uh, groups of uh, far-right groups and they are um, using, uh, it's becoming increasingly anti-Semitic. Yeah. Uh, they 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 pose as Holocaust victims. They carry um, um, stars of David as as if they were uh, persecuted by the rules of coronavirus, like posing as uh, as, as as victim themselves of, of this of this aggression from the state because they are obliged to carry the masks. And the central um, the central the central right of uh, Judent in, in Deutschland they 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 complained about this how this. Mm anti-Semitism tendencies are, were getting into these uh, conspirational theories in the debate here. And some people, they just believe it. They just believe that this, this, this has some connection. So it is, again, has nothing to do with service, with practice, with religion, but mm -hmm. it's targeting a group of people, yeah. um, the Jews in these days. And it's, 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 a, it's a bad development. I think they inspired some people here because I just read that the Gilets Jaunes, you know, the yellow jacket yeah. uh, protesters from last year are going to hold a protest against masks here in Paris. I think it's next Saturday, or this, you know, this coming Saturday. Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. When, um, when we have heard about uh, the North America uh, panel di dialogue, they're talking quite a, a lot about how religious groups are uh, participating in helping out during the pandemic. They have the Sikh community of Los Angeles uh, handing out food uh, during distribution, helping people. Do you have, have you seen anything like that? Do uh, the faith communities uh, play any role? Maria Paz, you mentioned something about more dialogue and then uh, a call to help from the leaders. But what yes, have you uh, seen what really happening? Um, uh, the, uh, like all communities, uh, the, the churches, synagogues, and um, particularly mosques, um, uh, have, are doing this, helping out uh, people who are getting unemployed. Because even mm -hmm. in Germany, where they, they are good in, good doing quite well, of course, those who have uh, worse uh, jobs, they are the ones who are being more hit by the economic crisis brought by the pandemic. So, you know, there's the usual um, distribution of food, of clothes, and um, this kind of things, again, very, very often in, in, in mosques and in churches. 
And uh, an, an interesting thing is that, of course, here in Germany, we have like uh, 5 million uh, Muslims, more or less. But in fact, the number is bigger because uh, there's also the refugees that arrived in the from the Middle East that arrived in the wave of 2015. So the numbers are not clear, but all those refugees are scattered around the country, uh, living in either in um, um, community uh, uh, allotments or in on or in um, or in, in houses, but they need uh, extra attention. So really, the, the the faith communities are addressing also this problem, which they were doing already. But with the pandemic, they are doing it, uh, it more. And again, in 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 Germany, uh, both the um, um, Protestant Church, like Evangelisch, and the Catholic Church, they are quite um, rich because of the um, tax system in Germany. So they can really do a lot of, of mm. good work in, in uh, charities helping the people in need. So I, I would say that that most of the of the communities have benefited from that also. Okay. So what are they doing really? Uh, handing out food or what are they doing? Yes, mostly it's handling out food, um, uh, clothes, and uh, trying to redirect uh, people who have lost their jobs to other kind of uh, jobs that are, that may be may be available. So like mm -hmm. like real usual things in in times of crisis uh, that that's not different from um, another type of economic crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you know about how that works also in Spain and Italy and uh, what the faith groups are doing there? Well, I cannot be specific about uh, what's going on in Spain because I'm looking from the outside and looking more at the political level. But uh, the, uh, the, um, the charity branch of the Catholic Church, which is Caritas, it's the name everywhere, has always been very, you know, um, on the ground to, to working with this. So, so they were developing the same. But one good thing is that if you have a strong um, a religious uh, institutional organization, when uh, things when bad things happen, it's quite easy to mobilize the volunteers because they were already there and because the institutions are ready for action. So, in this sense, this uh, this this worked uh, quite uh, quite well, I think. So, Elena, uh, you uh, have you're in the area that this has been more most tense of us. Uh, has the faith groups, the church, uh, done anything for those in need? Uh, yes, uh, in Serbia? yeah, churches and, and religious communities, not just in Serbia but in the region, uh, as I saw, they gave donation in medical equipment and also offering people. Uh, food and not just food but buying them food because uh, for older people uh, who sh couldn't go out they just bought them it was i have to admit that um, except on their web pages or if you know someone personally or if you see that call in the church you couldn't more or less you couldn't see that in media so often mm -hmm. so even you could hear some kind of com complaint like wh whenever we do something good no one see that see mm -hmm. that uh, mm. But also, when it comes yeah, that uh, of, of when it comes to this, let's say positive things, uh, I would say that, for example, uh, minority religions in the older regions. So, my, uh, for example, I don't know Serbian Orthodox Church somewhere or Catholic Church in Serbia, or uh, they acted uh, also very responsibly from the very beginning, you know, and they uh, very fast they switch their way of normal functioning to, to uh, some, I don't know, to virtual services, to so, so on and so on. And why is that important? Okay, they were, they served, they could serve as an examples in, 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 uh, in the society, but also, you know, they do not, they are not so, they don't like to change anything so much, but it, it was quite fast, you know, how they just did it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also I mentioned this, what, and th this is the, finally, I mentioned these voices within the church and some of, of, of bishops of the Serbian Orthodox Church and uh, other uh, religious communities representatives really sent very rational uh, the messages, which are, was full, of, but not just you know empty hope, but you know very reflective, very important messages in in, in the public. So that was that I would emphasize some positive things in mm. this sea of negative things. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how has it been to be a religious a religion reporter during this time? What have you seen that has surprised you, Helena? Well, you know, that 
That's great <laughs> America award. It was challenging. <laughs> because Why? Why? It, well, uh, it was, um, this, for example, as I mentioned, this question, Eucharist, uh, or, or this question going into the church, uh, that was, for one, that was really like what the church is doing, you know, they cannot do it. It should be punished harshly. It should be, you no, know, it was a lot of fears everywhere. It, uh, and for the other side, uh, the part of the church really felt that like a strong attack, you know, on, on, on their core being and so on and so on. So in, uh, it was hard, in, you know, and it is already the, the, those fluid, crazy time, Corona times. So you, could, you should find some balance in order not to provoke even more, um, in, uh, not to make situation uh, uh, even more fluid because what was also the problem we didn't have so clear guidelines, for example, let's uh, take Serbian Patriarch. At first he was, uh, of course, we should obey the government rules. And the second was, we should, of course, but if, if you have need to go to the church, go. And third, the president said, okay, it's forbidden, but if, the, uh, if you go, I will not do anything. So it was always, you know, many things involved. So in order to make it clear, it was, as I said, challenging, <laughs> and you know. So and tell me in Serbia, Tom, how has it been in France to be a religion a religion writer? Well, uh, first of all, you couldn't go to any church because they closed them down, and everybody did that. So there wasn't any discussion about that. Uh, secondly, the uh, you could you could only talk to people on the phone. Like we were literally. Uh, limited to a one kilometer radius mm -hmm. so you know with it you, know, you can only go within one kilometer and mm -hmm. you had to carry a, a document saying where you lived and everything and so police could figure it out you know I got stopped one time and they asked I was out on my mm -hmm. bicycle <laughs> uh, so there, there wasn't much you could do then mm -hmm. and the there were a few incidents during the lockdown one which was so typically French, uh, they were allowed to make uh, YouTube broadcasts and most of the churches had broadcasts. So they had their, their daily mass and Sunday mass and all. And since there's, there's, there's a, an anti-clerical tradition here, policemen heard some noise inside a church and broke into it and there were only seven people there, including the priest who was there and there were technicians to broadcast it. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to come in and arrest them for breaking the rules. And mm -hmm. They were allowed to have more, they were allowed to have 12 people, I think, together. Mm -hmm. They were allowed to broadcast it. That, that sent the Archbishop of Paris up the wall. Mm -hmm. He was screaming about it and he exaggerated it. And then you as a journalist, you were not able to go in there and cover no, it. There was no, way that, no that, was, that was too far away. Yeah. So, uh, no, the, the thing that I find most interesting is, in fact, something that is it's a long feature to write about. Uh, they don't have people going back to church, uh, partly because they're afraid of infection, partly mm -hmm. because they don't like the idea of having to reserve a space and we're not quite sure and things mm -hmm. like that. Partly because a lot of people got used to either watching mass on Sunday on the television or they just said why should i go i can't you know i can't go see my friends and i can't so the director of notre dame cathedral said the other day that about 30 percent of the people seem to have stopped going to church and he, he doesn't know whether they're actually going to come back so maybe you know some of them are older and they're afraid of getting infected and all I can add something to just what said before about what did the churches do. They did all the typical charity work, mm -hmm. but uh, in contrast to Germany, where the churches have a lot of money, here in France they don't, because they don't get any money from the state, no, no taxes like that. It's all, they get it out of the collections and contributions. So they, they're worrying now, you know, what if people don't come back? Because mm -hmm. they have suffered a big drop in income. Mm -hmm. And the, the rector, when he was talking, uh, the rector from Notre Dame, he said, uh, you know, we have food banks and things like that, but we need money to keep that running. And if mm. we run out of money, uh, mm. we can't do it anymore. You can't be charitable if you can't go and 
get the, the things you're going to be distributing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the situation here. Future economic questions coming up uh, and will go on for a long time, yeah. probably. Yeah. yeah. And uh, add from Norway, we see the same thing. We, the churches uh, have gone online and uh, they are so uh, worried, um, many of them, that people might not come back to church. Yeah. So why should they? And they don't want to register because maybe they're taking someone else's place that should be there instead of you. So we don't really know because it hasn't really started uh, yet. But that is what we're talking about uh, here in Norway. So, uh, go it was to you. There was even a round of like church shopping. So, like at the English language Catholic church here, some people started uh, listening to preachers in England or in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And the priest here, an Irish priest, told me he was getting people from America, from Asia, from South Africa. And there was apparently this sort of shopping around. Oh, maybe it's nicer over there, mm -hmm. nicer church, or they, you like the preacher. That's, yeah. And then they wonder, <laughs> these people come back to us, or will they just go to the YouTube all the time now? <laughs> That's the advantage of the English speaking. So let's go to uh, Maria Paz. Uh, uh, how has it been in, uh, in Germany uh, for the churches and the uh, other communities? You mean for the coverage of the religion report? Sorry, I didn't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. How has it been for you to cover them during oh, the pandemic? Yeah. We're going to wrap uh, up soon, but we, so we need just, to... Um, in fact, uh, here we have had a very mild uh, lockdown, even when it, when it was a lockdown. So, uh, and it was in spring and then summer, so you could really do interviews on the open air. If you keep the distance 1.5 meters, it's okay. So it was mostly about you know, uh, starting uh, getting dates and uh, time and and, and and do the interviews. The bad thing, as uh, Tom mentioned, is that there were uh, less uh, celebrations, less Veranstaltungen, uh, less things to go and where you can go around and just find stories uh, spontaneously. That disappeared. You just cannot go to places so easily. So that was, has been a hindrance. But, uh, but the really big challenge has been to cope with all these press conferences via Zoom, <laughs> which is finally even tiring uh, if, if, you go, if you go through them, but uh, there, weren't, there weren't many. Just wanted to mention very quickly something related to Spain that I forgot to mention before. Um, there has been in Spain, to my knowledge, the only one uh, national memorial uh, for the victims of COVID-19, which was lay totally. Mm -hmm. Um, not, not, not religious and uh, presided by the king and the queen and all the government and that was really a, a moving thing where a nurse explained about the social the, the, the health workers mm -hmm. on the front line and relatives of the people who died and then there was also um, a funeral in the cathedral of Madrid uh, organized by the Catholic bishops but this uh, I think it was quite of a milestone to have this lay funeral celebration in, 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 the, in, the, in the town. And as I said, to my knowledge, I haven't seen anything similar in, in, in other parts of Europe where there's even, they have even had more deaths mm. than Spain, like for instance, in, 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 in the UK where they had like a lot of death and, mm. or in France even. Mm. So that was an interesting development that I had forgotten to okay. mention. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We've been speaking, talking together for um, uh, more than half an hour. It's been so interesting to listen to all of you, to talking to all of you. Uh, thank you very much to Maria Paz in Berlin, Tom in Paris, and Jelena in uh, Serbia, Montenegro. And thank you very much to Andy Biani sitting in, in Indonesia recording this. And thank you to everyone watching. Thank you for joining us on our website. You will also find the other panel discussions, and there will be more to come. Thank you very much.